moms right after delivery, they become, um, they go into ARDS and conventional ventilation isn't working, we'll try high frequency, that's not working. And rather than just letting them die, they've been cannulating them and putting them on ECMO, but it takes like three months for their lungs to heal before they can come off ECMO. So they spend three months in ICU on ECMO, and the ventilator's also on them, but usually just like a backup, giving a little bit of PEEP, a little bit of ventilation. Um, and then hopefully within three months, they haven't developed major sepsis, they haven't died and their lungs get better. So I don't know if that's where you heard ECMO because they're using it in the adult ICU a lot in Memorial. Isn't a lot of pregnant after giving birth? Well, there were two. Oh, <laughs> Out of the people on ECMO last year and the year before, there were it was two ladies that after delivery, they were in ARDS. Yeah, I guess they stand out because they're so young and you know, to go from healthy to ARDS to ECMO. And Three months of being in ICU. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. All right, so two o'clock. Um, let me talk about meconium aspiration and then we'll stop with the neonatal lecture and then start up with advanced equipment. All right, this picture is, is an artist's rendering of um, baby poop in the airway. <laughs> So what happens in utero is that the intestines start digesting bile and whatever else is in the amniotic fluid. So it, it starts maturing by actually working. And by the time a baby is born, they'll have their first poop, usually after they're born. And the poop comes out and it's very, it's like tar that you would put on, um, you know, a walkway to tar it or something. It's very thick and sticky. Um, if there's something that occurs while the infant, while the fetus is in utero, and it causes them to become stressed for some reason, um, they'll pass their poop while they're still in utero, and now it gets into the amniotic fluid that's that they're floating in, and that will end up in their airway. So it can happen. Um, what percentage of the time? I was saying like two to three percent. But it's rare that that becomes a complication. Usually um, it was intubate suction, and now they don't even intubate and suction unless there's signs of distress right away. Then they'll intubate and try to suction the meconium out. So most of the time there isn't a complication. Now here's a picture of that, that tarry substance, the baby's first poop. So it's green-tinged, tar-like bowel substance passed by the infant within 48 hours after delivery. It's a sterile substance made up of swallowed amniotic fluid, salts, intestinal tract secretions, bile, intrauterine debris. It occurs in full-term or post-term infants with hypoxemia. Um, and the reason that it occurs in full term and not premature um, babies is because the anal sphincter has to develop, and the anal sphincter hasn't developed in preemies. So they're not going to have a possibility of meconium aspiration if they become stressed or hypoxic. Only full term has a developed anal sphincter, and then this could happen. The response to hypoxemia in utero is vasoconstriction, gastrointestinal peristalsis, and anal sphincter relaxation. And then meconium is passed into the amniotic fluid. Um, gasping inspirations force the amniotic fluid into the glottis and into the airways. 
Um, once born, you'll see meconium staining on the skin, the nails, the umbilical cord, in the wrinkles and the creases of the skin. So you see in the picture how you've got the green tinged meconium? Mm -hmm. It's a big baby. Um, watch for signs of distress. Only with distressed, only with distress is the infant intubated and the meconium suctioned from the airway. So what happens when the meconium gets into the airway is it plugs up the airway, obviously, because it's thick and hard. But remember when we breathe in, our airways open up a little bit? We were talking about that in the a couple weeks ago. Yeah, totally. So we breathe in, the airways open up a little bit. And then when we exhale, they close a little bit. Mm -hmm. So if you have meconium in the airway, the airway will open during inspiration, and air can get past the meconium in the airway. But then on exhalation, when the airway closes a little bit, now the meconium has the airway blocked off. So the air can get in, but it can't get back out. So do that for several breaths, and guess what happens? Air trapping and a pneumothorax can occur. Because you get too much air, and it can't escape anywhere, and then it, it um, pops the alveoli, and now you have a pneumothorax. So that's the ball valve effect that it's talking about. So as you'll have, on uh, x-ray, you'll have areas of irregular densities. Do you see areas of irregular densities? Um, I don't. <clears throat> to the left, I'm sorry, to the right side of the heart? Like, there's usually not that big old space of a radio piece. Yes. Like in here, like these little white things? Would it, would I don't it know what we're looking at. Radio opaque, wouldn't it be white? Um, yes. I was saying to the right side, um, right next to the, I guess, bifurcation where you see the bifurcation, there's a little circle of, of just radio opaque stuff. This? Yeah, that area. Ah, okay. Because that, usually the heart doesn't extend that far to the right side, it's usually more to the left. Yeah, that's a good point. So but that doesn't even look like it's a part of the heart. It looks more opaque than the heart, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, these little circles. Yeah. Um, you'll see a depressed diaphragm because of the air trapping that's occurring and possible pneumothorax. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Looks like um, back information. Like oh, here we go. If the infant is born through meconium-stained amniotic fluid and presents with poor muscle tone and inadequate breathing efforts, the initial steps of resuscitation should be completed under the radiant warmer, obviously. Um, positive pressure ventilation should be initiated if the infant is not breathing or if the heart rate is less than 100 per minute. Um, routine intubation for tracheal suction in this setting is not suggested, suggested because there is insufficient evidence to continue recommending this practice. So you beg them, if they start breathing on their own, then you don't do anything else. How do you diagnose it? Well, you'll see the staining when the baby's born. Um, the treatment, if they're depressed at birth, in other words, they're arms and legs are flaccid, they're not making effort to breathe, or they have gasping respirations, um, then you suction the meconium from the airway. So you intubate and then you suction. If there's severe meconium aspiration, then you can use mechanical ventilation, but you have to use low ventilating pressures. Why do you think that's important? Um, you're not trying to hurt their lungs enough, and they're already hurt. Yeah. yeah, you'll just worsen the chances of a pneumothorax, because they've already got air trapping occurring. Now if you give a lot of positive pressure and you're pushing more air in, it's going to increase pneumothorax, the chances of a pneumothorax. And giving some exogenous surfactant, 
can help babies that have meconium aspiration. An infant is born with meconium staining in the skin and in the mouth. Respirations are unlabored. Heart rate is 120 per minute and the skin is pink. You would recommend A, do nothing and observe. B, section orally and observe. C, intubate and suction the meconium. Or D, intubate suction and place on mechanical ventilation. A, B, B, B. Yeah, it's A. It, it's nothing observed. Yeah, it said that. Yeah, because less than 100. Uh -huh. it it's it's 120 and the skin is pink. He's not labored. He doesn't have labor free. So even if it's even in the mouth, you can see it. You can't, like, it, like, it's it's like take the little stuff down. Doesn't it make sense to do that? Yeah. Yeah. It goes down. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you want to so, do like an x ray? Mm -hmm. um, the guidelines from Neo NALS, Neonatal Advanced Life Support, is you only suction if there's few, uh, neonatal distress. So I asked Rolf, hey, are we no longer both suctioning the mouth? And he goes, where did you hear that? <laughs> so sometimes textbook and practice doesn't match up, and this is one of them. So suction orally and observe is what's being done. You oh, still oh, use the bulk syringe and get whatever you can out of the mouth. You just don't automatically intubate. Mm, got it. Yeah, because when they're born, they just suction anything. With what? No, when they're born, they anyway, they suction? Do that anymore. Like if they well, you know that you guys do that still. Like you, when they're born, you. Yeah, she's saying that. textbook though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Textbook. Do it. Yeah. But it's textbook. Textbook says she says yeah. Yeah. Right. For yeah. tenant purposes. <laughs> 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 we do nothing to observe. Do not do not even observe. observe. Let him just. So I just do nothing. Do nothing. Go in your comfort. Parentheses suction. <laughs> and that's it for today. So let me tell you a little bit about advanced equipment. You need to get up and walk around a little bit.